Okay, we're very happy to have uh, Stefan Hetzel from the Institute of Discrete Mathematics and Geometry in uh, from uh, Wien, Austria, speaking about arithmetical theories and the automation of induction. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you also to the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk here. So um, before I get started, I should say that this is joint work with Yannick Fierling, who is a PhD student of mine. So, and actually most of the results that I'm about to present here are uh, included in Yannick's PhD thesis. So <clears throat> this, um, this work here is an attempt to connect two um, areas of research. Now, on the one hand, um, theories in, of arithmetic and mathematical logic. So you all know this area. I don't have to say anything to introduce this here. But on the other hand, um, the area of automated inductive theorem proving in computer science. Um, and since this may not be as well known here, I, I will say a few words about this. So the, the basic uh, aim of this uh, area is to develop algorithms that find proof by induction automatically. And this has a long history in computer science going back to at least the, the 1970s. And it's, uh, I mean, part of a larger area of automated deduction um, whose aim is to develop algorithms that find proofs automatically, you know, in, in various systems, various theories. I mean, one particularly well-developed part of that is uh, to find proofs in pure first order logic. So, I mean, even though it's an undecidable problem, there is quite mature methods for that since at least the, the 1990s. In the presence of induction, things are more difficult somehow. <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, one can say a lot about this, but um, to boil it down to a single slogan, uh, the point is essentially that uh, in the presence of induction, there is no cut elimination theorem, uh, at least not for, for say, arbit proofs of arbitrary formulas. And this has a strong effect on proof search algorithms, because if you have a cut elimination theorem, you can restrict your proof search algorithm to essentially just um, sub formulas of the theorem that you want to show. Um, I mean, of course, there's this notion of subformulas to be adapted to, to yeah. the Stefan, to the can logic. I ask something? Yes, of course. Yes, please. So, please so interrupt me at any time. Yeah. So uh, you're basically saying that if you have cut elimination, you can uh, restrict yourself to looking for a cut-free proof, uh, I, I guess. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, how unpractical or how practical is that? Because as you know, the theoretical uh, lower bounds on uh, the proof size blow up and cut elimination are pretty insane. So does that ever arise in practice as a consideration or you know what I mean, right? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Going to be yes, I mean, sentences with very long cut free proofs. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue for this proof search algorithm is, is not so much the length of the shortest proof, but it is the size of the search space. So the, the, the mere fact that there exist uh, short proofs with cut is not very useful for proof search if you have no way of, of finding good cut formulas. And the, the real practical problem is uh, to find good cut formulas. So, the, so there, I mean, you never know. I mean, there, there's no theoretical result prohibiting such good algorithms, but I mean, so far what people have come up with, the, these are algorithms that are not very effective in, 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 in guessing or, or developing. Yeah. And it, and it still, still makes sense. And there are going to be many interesting sentences with shortcut free proofs that can be. Found. Yes, 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 okay, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I will say a bit more about what, what kind of sentences um, we, we are looking at here. But um, I mean, compared to what we are used to proving as a mathematician, these are very, very, very basic uh, trivial sentences, you would probably say. Yeah, so the point is not so much to use these techniques to solve uh, deep open mathematical problems. The point is to help reduce the workload on a, on a human user of a system where you're a formalizer proof. Yeah, so the, the automated methods are supposed to fill in little details, not to, to provide the big proof strategy. Okay, so since this is a quite difficult problem, many different methods have been developed, um, different algorithms, different implementations. So I'm not going to, to say much about this here, just uh, to, to mention a few names. Uh, 
one thing is recursion analysis, term rewriting, rippling. I will say a little bit about extension of saturation-based proofs and about cyclic proofs, and also approaches like theory exploration that, so to say, don't start from a particular goal, but rather from the axioms and see what kind of things they can prove from these axioms. And as I mentioned, I mean, the typical problems that, that you want to deal with here are, but from a mathematical point of view, you could only call trivial. Yeah, so you want to prove things like the commutativity of addition from say the axioms of Robinson's arithmetic plus some restricted form of induction. Or uh, things like, for example, if you work in a context of lists, you would like to prove that the length of the reversal of a list is equal to the length of the original list. Yeah, so this is, uh, as I said, not, there's no deep conjectures, but there are somehow little proof goals that if you're interested in, in I don't know, verifying software or formalizing mathematical proofs that you come across and that if the computer cannot solve this, you have to solve it yourself. And so the, the aim here is really to, to reduce the, the burden of the human user. And from the methodological point of view, the, the state of the art in this area is uh, usually that um, implementations are evaluated empirically. Oh, uh, so, Stefan, yes. so can, can I ask just a simple of question course. again about the, the previous bullet? That, mm -hmm. you know, so so for, for these sort of simple questions, you start with some very established uh, axiomatic base, like yeah. uh, but uh, is it, practical to say start with whatever that you already have some base that has richer environment but not necessarily the axioms that we usually use but you have you have already proved several things and then you yes. have to find another similar uh proof of some re somewhat related question yes yes so so of course i mean these these are just very simple examples i can i can explain in this context here in, in a minute or two of course, in, in realistic applications, say within a prover system, there will be a large background theory of things you already know. And um, right. I mean, different provers have different ways of, of trying to use this, this background theory. But but yes, I mean, in general, of course, there's uh, somehow user supplied axiomatization and not some kind of standard mm -hmm. axiomatization mm -hmm. as you would think about for, for Robinson's arithmetic, say. All right, thanks, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so so I wanted to say here about the, the empirical evaluations that, I mean, what people usually do in this area is they, they implement an, an algorithm and try it out on some uh, challenge problems and then observe whether it, it finds a solution within a certain specified timeout, like like one minute maybe or five minutes. So, I mean, this makes sense from, from, from an empirical point of view. I mean, after all, computer science is an engineering discipline, but from a mathematical point of view, it's a bit unsatisfying because we don't know what would happen if we would have a more efficient implementation or uh, I don't know, a larger timeout. So our motivation here is to say something more definitive using tools from, from mathematical logic. And the strategy here or the, the strategy is to, to use techniques we know from mathematical logic in order to classify the strength of these methods from computer science. And once we have sufficiently good such classification to use tools for mathematical logic to obtain independent results for these, these methods from computer science. <clears throat> so, I mean, as a, as a sketch, which I think conveys the picture quite well, this, this would look something like this. Um, what we have here is some kind of method for finding proofs automatically, some, some method from computer science. I am using the zigzag lines to, to indicate the fact that the set of formulas provable by such a method is usually not a very nice set. So in particular, very often, this will not be closed under modus ponens or not even under instantiation, as it's not a theory in the sense of mathematical logic. And then, I mean, our work consists of trying to find an upper bound of this method in the sense that we come up with uh, some theory now in the sense of mathematical logic that can prove everything which this M can also prove. And once we have this, that's somehow point one here, we can forget about this method M and 
take an independence result or develop an independence result for t, you know, some sentence sigma, which is true, but not provable in t, and it will automatically give us a, a result about this method m. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, on this level of abstraction, there is a very simple way to, to do this. Namely, you can just take piano arithmetic for t and then take some known to be unprovable sentence like the consistency of PA. Um, the problem with this is, uh, this is entirely unsatisfying to the computer scientists. So if I, if I would go to them with a result like this, tell them your method cannot prove the consistency of PA, they will simply reply that they are not interested in proving the consistency of PA. They would consider this a too, too difficult uh, problem, somehow out of reach of their method. So the, the aim here is really to, to push down this T and also the sigma to a level that is interesting to the computer scientists. Yeah, so in this in the context of this work, we, we call this practically meaningful independence results. By that we mean that this sigma here should be of a level of complexity like this commutativity of addition or that this reversal of the length of the list example. Yeah, so some uh, example that would actually be considered as, as in the scope of their methods by the computer scientists. So this means, of course, that we have to consider much weaker theories than PA. Yeah, so we have to, to work with uh, very weak arithmetical theories here. <clears throat> so before I get started, I, I would like to mention some, some general uh, specifics, uh, so some general remarks on the, on the specifics of this, of this setting here. So I think this comes back a little bit to the, to the question that, that I think Roman asked before that um, often the, the method as well as the theory, they are not somehow fixed in the sense of, of T or, or M being in a particular language and having some particular basic axioms, but they are somehow parametric in some kind of uh, background language and axiom set provided by the user. So this, this makes the whole picture a bit more complicated, but um, still, I mean, the, this, this essential relationship remains. One other thing that's somehow unusual here is that coding does not play a role. You know, the, the, the reason is that these theories are simply too weak to allow for coding. And also, I mean, if one is interested in practical applications, coding induces an, an amount of, of, of overhead, which is just not feasible to deal with in, in practice. So therefore, um, in this setting here, we are not dealing only with theories of numbers, but uh, also with theories of, of lists or trees or, or some inductive data structures, because they, they are somehow interesting for the computer scientists for, for applications. One other aspect is that um, in this setting, bounded quantifiers are not distinguished from unbounded quantifiers. So, I mean, essentially, I think the main reason for this is that developing an algorithm that would, would uh, introduce any kind of, of, of quantifier in an induction formula is so difficult already from the point of view that uh, it is somehow not worthwhile to even distinguish bounded from unbounded quantifiers. I mean, what I'm talking about here has very little uh, connection to computational complexity. Uh, there, of course, we know that bounded quantifiers are very important, but here we are dealing with a problem that is undecidable from the start. So, um, or, or I mean, usually it is. I mean, uh, so so therefore. These, these questions are not so important, whether it quantifies bounded or not. And okay, one, one thing that's uh, that I will also come back to later is that sometimes these methods are quite idiosyncratic and, and this is also hard to get rid of. This, this will sometimes be reflected in, in the theory T. Okay. So my plan is to look at um, three specific settings somehow sorted by, by increasing strength. First, I'd like to say something on induction on literals, then move on to open induction, and then say something about existential induction. 
So uh, well, as you can see, these are all very, very weak uh, theories. So a literal, I mean, it's, it's just an atom or a negated atom. And then we just consider literal induction in, in the, I think, usual sense. So, so what you would expect. So we have the ordinary successor axiom. And uh, for a set of formulas, gamma induction will just be the induction axioms for uh, formulas from this set. And in particular, then we can talk about literal induction. Okay, all this over some kind of background language, which at least contains successor and zero. And now, on the level of, uh, of computer science, um, there is a, a system I, I would like to to introduce that corresponds in a, in a, in a way to, to literal induction. Wait, wait, what, um, does Adam, what does Adam mean in all that? I mean, did you, did you say, you mean like an atomic formula or? Uh, yes, what, sorry. What? Yes, an, an atom is just an atomic formula, yeah, yeah. All right, so there's some signature you're not describing, okay? But you've got yes, atomic, yes, yes, okay. Yes. But you've got atomic formulas in the usual sense. So, okay, fine. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the on the computer science side, the, the we we can we can uh, look at the the system of that is based on say saturation theorem proving. So. And so this is a, a standard technique for automated theorem proving in, in pure first order logic. And uh, it's based on class logic. So a, a class is just a disjunction of literals. So again, I mean, disjunction of atomic formulas or negated atomic formulas. And a saturation system is a set of rules. I'm not going to, to make this very precise here, but essentially a rule takes a, uh, well, finite, set of clauses and derives from that you know, another finite set of clauses, usually even a single clause. So um, for example, the, the resolution rule is uh, this one here. It's the some of the most central rule for, for most of these uh, systems. So here we have a, a clause with one literal L um, marked here. And here we have another clause with uh, another literal L prime marked here. Now, from these two, I can derive the clause C or D to which I apply a substitution sigma, which is what's called the most general unifier of L and the dual of L prime. Okay, so um, the idea is simply to, to instantiate the free variables in L and L prime um, in such a way that uh, after instantiation, these literal L and the dual of L prime will be identical. So this is a, I mean, proof theoretically, this is just something like two instantiations plus an atomic cut, okay? And um, a class set, so that's just a, a set of classes, is said to be closed under a saturation system S if whenever the, the premises, C1 to Cn of some nary rule R, uh, rho are in C, then so is the conclusion. And the, the idea is that given some input class set uh, C, uh, we compute or we, we approximate rather the, the, the closure by repeatedly applying all inference rules to all classes. Uh, so, this, so this will generate a, a, an increasing sequence of class sets um, well, who, who, that, that converges against some, some limit, uh, the closure of C under the system. But of course, after a finite amount of time, it never reaches it. <clears throat> uh, such a saturation system is called sound if it only derives clauses which logically follow from the original class set. And it is called refutationally complete if uh, whenever the original class set is unsatisfiable, then uh, the empty class here, so that the contradiction is uh, derived by the system. So this is some kind of standard setting for theorem proving in, in pure first order logic. Um, and I mean, for pure first order logic, there is sound and refutationally complete systems. And, and th these, are, these are used a lot. So what do we do with induction in, in this setting? Um, 
the simple or I don't know most basic idea is that we uh, add a new uh, rule without any premise that allows to add an induction axiom into our current class set at any point in time. So, so phi is our induction formula. I x is the induction axiom for phi. And since we are dealing with class logic, um, we have to scolemize the formula and compute a conjunctive normal form. So this is uh, written here. But I mean, essentially it means to, to add the induction axiom to your search space. So, I mean, here, of course, you, you see the, the, the problem computationally, if you think about proof search, um, where do you get this phi from? Yeah, so if in, after, I don't know, a certain number of iterations, you decide to-, to... So you're scolemizing, right? So you're, again, you're changing the signature as you do this? You're yes, yes, yes. All, yes, yes. All so, that apparatus is, is you have to carry along as you're doing this. Yes, so. yes, exactly. Yeah, so actually this, um, this changes of signature introduced by scholarization, this um, is uh, a point that's a bit difficult to deal with technically. Yeah, so as you say, I mean, you have to carry this around somehow, but yeah, I, I hoped to to sweep this under the rug here, but And then you, you turn that and you put that, whatever result of all that into conjunctive normal form is what- Exactly, said, exactly, yeah. That's, which is that's, algorithmic, yeah. I guess. Yes, 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 so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so so what do people in, in, in computer science do? Well, I mean, they have somehow invented specialized forms of this rule. So in particular, in this vampire theorem prover, that's one of the well best or most well-known uh, first of the theorem provers, they have introduced this rule here for dealing with induction. So the idea is here that you have some clause and some particular literal that you know, for some reasons you would like to get rid of. And then uh, the idea is to introduce an induction axiom that would allow to prove this uh, literal. Yeah? So it would somehow reduce this literal to an induction base and an induction step. So concretely, the way this works is a bit similar as, as we had above. So we have this literal LA uh, and we introduce an induction axiom for LX. So we we abstract from this uh, from this a, and um, for, for, I mean uh, one additional restriction is that this a must be a constant symbol. This uh, I believe has to do with pure efficiency considerations. In principle, of course, you could also replace larger terms, but then your search space increases because you would have more uh, ways of applying the rule. Uh, so, so you abstract some occurrences of this A into an X and carry out induction on that. So if I take some sound saturation system plus this rule, so this SCIND uh, is a shortcut for single class induction. Um, if I take uh, this, this single class induction and the sound saturation system, then for example, it can uh, refute this class set here. So, these two equations are the, the usual definition of uh, of addition from uh, successor and zero. Um, this one is um, you have to mention this as an uh, so to say equation on the right hand side of of, of your goal. So uh, what you want to prove here is that for all x, x plus x plus x is equal to x plus x plus x, and well since this is a refutational uh, calculus. You have to move this goal to the left-hand side. Uh, so the universal quantifier will become an existential quantifier. And this C here is simply the scolem constant of, I mean, of this existential quantifier. Yeah, so, um, so this is a, a very simple uh, example, but it's, it has uh, quite interesting properties that we had some, some discussions with, with the authors of this proof concerning this example. So um, I'm mentioning this here. <clears throat> so, but our aim is, is uh, so to say, not the, the positive results, but, but the negative results, the independence results. And, and to this aim, now we have to first um, 
reduce or, or this uh, this uh, system to a theory. And um, the characterization theorem that, that we have is now the following. So, okay, again, we, we start from some sound saturation system S and we take an exists two theory. So all the axioms of T must be existential two formulas. And then the result is this. So if, if S plus the single clause induction refutes, well, the, the theory T in a, in a suitable form, so the CNF of this colonization, then the theory plus literal induction is inconsistent. So the, the reason why we restrict to exists two here is precisely connected to this problem with colonization. So um, that means that means six sigma two formulas? Is that what there exists for all? Yes, so, yes, so yes. Okay. So so I, I try to avoid speaking about sigma two well, here. That's right, but you said that in the context of yeah, bounded quantifiers don't matter. Exactly, so it's not exactly. Quite the yeah, usual. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, wait, so what does that? What does there exist to mean exactly? Well, it means that uh, all the uh, form, all the axioms are start with a block of existential quantifiers followed by a block of universal quantifiers oh, oh, okay. followed just, by just... a quantifier-free formula. Okay, okay, fine. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah just yeah, in yeah. the most plain vanilla sense. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, but, but this restriction has to do with columnization um, because, I mean, columnizations of exists two theories only introduce column constants. And these are comparatively easy to deal with. Um, but, and it's also, I mean, from a point of view of application, it's a, it's a realistic assumption uh, for situations where the prover gets uh, his input in, in uh, class logic already, which, which is often the case. <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at uh, an independence result based on this on this characterization. So here I'm defining a particular theory T, um, which is uh, again very basic. So we only know that zero is not uh, a successor, and we know that the successor function is injective. And then we have two additional predicates uh, in the language: a unary predicate E and a unary predicate O, which are I mean, essentially it's supposed to represent the even and odd numbers, right? So zero is even, if x is even, then x plus one is odd, and if x is odd, then x plus uh, one is even. And again, uh, we want to refute the existence of a C that is both even and odd. And um, actually this theory T together with literal induction is consistent. Yeah, so literal induction is not enough to show that every number is even or odd in, in this setting, because, well, essentially you need this this disjunct, disjunction in, in the induction. Yeah. And from this, we get the immediate corollary that, uh, well, for any sound saturation system S, if we add this single clause induction rule, we cannot refute this theory. Yeah, so the, I mean, this is now, Essentially, there's the situation I had in this in this picture before. So our method M is this uh, sound saturation system S together with the single class induction rule. And our theory T is the, the literal induction. Uh, and the somehow simplification here consists in the fact that after this, this first theorem, we can completely forget about saturation and, and class logic. And for the second theorem only deal uh, well, with, with with a more or less nice mathematical, um, with a more or less nice theory from from the point of view of mathematical logic. Yeah, and this I mean this model of T plus literal induction is something very easy. I mean, some something you can immediately define. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And the nice thing, I mean, from the point of view of computer science uh, and of this example is that this is actually something this, uh, the, they would consider to be in the scope of their method. I mean, of course, they want to prove such things like every number is even or odd, but they cannot do so with this induction. So this, is, so this serves to them as a, as a motivation to develop a somehow stronger induction rule, which hopefully still is as efficient in proof search as the previous one. Okay, so um, I would like 
to move on to, to open induction now. Um, I will not say much about this, but uh, a small remark that I, I think is quite interesting here. Um, so open induction has, has been studied uh, by, by Schoenfeld and Shepperson for, for arithmetic. And there is this, uh, I think the first uh, result of this kind was by Schoenfeld from 58, that uh, over some basic uh, axioms, he showed that open induction is equivalent to a few nice, essentially algebraic properties, namely commutativity, associativity, uh, cancellation, and, and the statement here that every number is uh, zero or a successor. And then uh, a bit later, Shepardson studied these systems of open induction quite systematically. There's a, a couple of nice papers on this. Um, looked at different languages and, and gave characterizations, uh, which were similar to that. So one thing we looked at was um, whether it would be possible to extend these kind of results to lists. Um, so this, this is interesting because, as I said, we, we don't have coding here, but the computer scientists, they also want to treat lists, trees, and other inductive data structures. So a uh, theory of lists that would be analogous to the to the to this uh, well linear arithmetic would be this one here. So we have a language that contains a constant symbol nil that's supposed to represent the empty list. We have a constructor cons, uh, that's a binary function symbol that takes uh, as a first argument, it takes an element and as a second argument, it takes a list and it uh, returns the list starting with the first argument and then continuing with the second argument. And we have a binary function symbol here for appending uh, two lists. And then it's quite easy to come up with analogous axioms. We can say that uh, nil is not uh, 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 not an empty list. <laughs> uh, we can say that uh, the so in the sense that nil is not a successor yeah, with this cons constructor. We can say that this cons function is injective. And these uh, two lines here give a well, primitive recursive definition of append from uh, from the constructors nil and cons. Um, so originally, I was hoping that there would be some similar nice characterization, but um, well, apparently not. So, um, so what we what we could show is that if you take this basic theory uh, together with open induction then you cannot prove the the cancellation law. So you had a, the right cancellation law. So if the list y appended with x and z appended with x are equal, then y is equal to z. And I mean, actually showing this uh, in, involves a, well, a model that uses transfinite lists to, to provide a counterexample to this cancellation property. So, so what this shows is that um, things do get more complicated if we move from numbers to lists, and um, it's not clear to me how how the picture would would look like in this situation. So, actually, this is some kind of of, of project I would I would like to undertake at at some point if if, if time permits <clears throat> to to try to study a bit more systematically the what could be called the subsystems of open induction. Um, as, as ridiculous as this may sound. Um, but um, so I mean, for for numbers, uh, I think a lot will come out of this of this of this uh, Schoenfeld and, uh, and Shepherdson results already. But but especially for lists and trees and other such inductive straight data structures, it's not at all clear to me how this looks like. I mean, what kind of things can we prove if we restrict induction to atoms or to literals, things like that. And this would be very useful to have for understanding these automated methods better, because uh, a lot of what is being done in computer science actually happens within open induction. <clears throat> okay, so this was the, the, the brief comment on open induction. Now I would like to, to move on to uh, existential induction. Um, and we'll see that there is another system from computer science that in some sense corresponds to existential induction. <clears throat> so the, the concept I would like to talk here are uh, closet cycles. 
so this is um, an abstraction of uh, this uh, n class calculus that has been introduced uh, well, almost 10 years ago now by Kazani and Peltier. So this this n class calculus is, is also a method for inductive theorem proving. And um, the, the essential idea is to carry out some proof by infinite descent in class logic. Okay, so, so the idea is this we start out with some class set C in some language L or some first order signature L. And uh, we add a new constant eta. This will be essentially this column constant of the goal. And it's a, somehow think of it as a designated point uh, on which to carry out induction. And a, a class set a cycle then is such as class set C, um, such that C of S eta implies C of eta and C zero is inconsistent. Uh, so it's like, like a proof by infinite descent. And well, what does it prove? Well, the idea is to take some other class set D eta and we say that d eta is refuted by a class set cycle C if d eta implies C eta. Yeah, so from, from the proof search point of view, algorithmically, the prover is supposed to generate such a C from the D. Yeah. And okay, so, so at first sight, this may look very restricted and you, I mean, it's easy to come up with countless variants, like, I don't know, making a step of two and, and having an induction base for zero and for one or making a step K and, and induction base correspondingly larger. But all of these variants are actually equivalent. So this is a, a quite robust notion. And it's also, I mean, quite, I mean, it can do some things well practically. So uh, for example, it can, uh, can solve this, this even odd example we had in the, in the previous section. And now <clears throat> for the for the logical uh, characterization. So um, for this, uh, we have to define a new induction rule. Th this will be a little strange and this is uh, somehow an idiosyncrasy of the method that is reflected in our theory. So how does this look like? Well, we have a set of formulas gamma and we define a gamma induction rule um, well, uh, as you would expect at some point, so we have an induction base, an induction step, but then we did not derive for all x phi x, <clears throat> but we derive phi eta for this uh, special scolem constant eta. So that's a, a very strong restriction in a sense. Um, okay, the, the gamma restriction is clearly that this formula phi must be from gamma. And also note that this formula phi is parameter free. So we only have this X as a single free variable. So this is the gamma induction rule or the parameter free gamma induction rule with the eta restriction. Okay. <clears throat> now, okay, to combine an inference rule with the theory, can be done in this, this well-known way. So TR is defined as T plus everything derivable from uh, the, the inference rule, um, uh, from one application of the inference rule. And then the, the characterization theorem we could obtain here is that uh, a class set D uh, is refuted by a class set cycle if and only if D together with this induction rule here applied to the empty theory is inconsistent. And I mean, this induction rule here, I should say, of course, for, for gamma being uh, exists one formulas. So again, in, in the sense we had before, an exists one formula is just a, a block of existentials followed by a quantifier free formula. So, I mean, one particularly nice thing here is that this is actually an exact characterization. Yeah, so this, this implication goes, I mean, there's implications in both directions um, in contrast to, to what we had before. Um, so it's maybe surprising why, why, where do we get this existential quantifiers from? But then again, if you think about it, a closet cycle is essentially a proof by contradiction in class logic. And in class logic, you have uh, 
uh, no quantifiers, so all the variables are implicitly quantified universally. So uh, by turning this proof by contradiction around, essentially, um, the existential quantifiers arise. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> So, okay, now also for this method, now we could uh, obtain an uh, independence result. Um, so here we work in the language of linear arithmetic with zero successor, predecessor, and, and plus. Okay, and okay, so, so I'm sorry, there's still a typo. So the successor of X, this should read, is different from zero. Um, and predecessor is the truncated predecessor. Here, this is the uh, definition of addition, plus uh, we have commutativity and associativity of addition. Um, the formulas uh, in this uh, independence result uh, will be, uh, well, this E, K, and M. So let's let's try to, to, to read this here. So N times X in the, signature of linear arithmetic just means x plus x plus x plus x n times. Um, this bar here is just a numeral. Um, and yes, so, so so why is this implication true? Well, I mean, how, how would you how would you prove this in the natural numbers? You would simply subtract n times x from both sides of this equation. Then you would have m minus n times k on the left and m minus m times x on the right. And then by, by dividing, you get x is equal to k. <clears throat> so so one example for k being 0, 1, 2 is simply this one. So x plus 0 is equal to x plus x implies that x is equal to 0. And what we could show is that um, if we take this base theory t plus, um, well, parameter-free existential one induction, um, then we cannot prove these E, K, and M, okay? So this again, at this point here, this is a purely logical result that has no nothing to do with computer science or class logic anymore. But of course, again, it gives a corollary, namely that E, K, and M, if, if you write it as a class set, um, is not refutable, it's not, or it cannot be refuted by any uh, class set cycle in this language. And it means it cannot be refuted for any k and m. Yes, 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 yes. Depends what these what these are. I see. Yeah, yeah. So, so here at the beginning of the theorem says for all k and m with zero less than m less than m, t does not prove. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and again, I mean, it's always the same story in a way. So, so this is a practically meaningful independence result in the sense that these kind of formulas are something that will make the computer scientists uneasy. Okay, so this, this is something they, they would like to prove, but somehow they cannot with this method. So they have to extend this. But, Stefan, but does yeah. some, so is, is there some dependence uh, among these sentences for different K and M, you know, some stronger, some weaker? Can you prove that some imply the other or so? Or they, it's, in other words, the proof, how does the proof go? What, what do you fix? Yeah, uh, well, um, so the, the proof will, I will show it on the next slide, actually. Um, I don't know if there is a dependence. In any case, the proof does not use any dependence. Um, so it just proves this for, for arbitrary K and M. Yeah, so, so let's maybe just look at the proof. Um, <clears throat> so one um, one comment also maybe on the, on the actual uh, result. So here we are not talking about the induction rule anymore, but about the induction axiom. And also we don't have this eta restriction anymore. So, so somehow we move up a little bit, we take a bit larger a theory to, to, to work with it more conveniently. Okay, so how does this, this proof go? Well, like most of our proofs, we somehow use some handcrafted counter models. So I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot present any, any strong techniques from, for model constructions here, but all of this essentially works by, by handcrafting models adapted to the particular situation at hand. So how does this counter model look like? Well, okay, so, so formally we have pairs, but I mean, the point is that we have one copy of the natural numbers and then countably many copies of the integers. Uh, and the, the first 
uh, element of the top of the, of the pair simply says in which component we are. And, and for zero, we are in the natural numbers and, and for greater than zero in some copy of the integers. Um, zero successor and predecessor are defined in the natural way. Okay, so I mean, the predecessor would be defined as truncated predecessor on the naturals and as ordinary predecessor on the, on the integers. The only non-standard thing here is, is the addition. So <clears throat> if we add two numbers, um, we well, we just add them in the in the in the second component, but we jump to the larger of the two copies in the first component. Okay, so the first thing is okay. We have to show that this model doesn't satisfy E, K, and M. But this is simple to do with with a calculation. So um, we will uh, well, let's let's maybe go through it. So for X, we will pick one K. So that's the number k in the in the first copy of the integers, and well, then n times one k is just n times one k, and the numeral is evaluated in, in the in the, uh, sorry in the natural numbers, and the addition here will move to the component one, so in total we get m times one k here. So this means that the left hand side of the implication is true, but but one k is not. 0k, which is the value of this numeral here. OK, so this, this jump out of the natural numbers will already destroy this, this property. <clears throat> OK, then we have to show that the model satisfies these basic axioms. But that's quite straightforward. I mean, these things like commutativity of addition, this is, is just, uh, we can verify this by looking at it. The The most interesting part is to show that uh, the model satisfies uh, the, the parameter free existential one induction. <clears throat> and this is, this is indeed a, a bit involved. Uh, and it essentially amounts to, to understanding what kind of things we can define with the parameter free, I mean, with this, with this existential one formulas in a parameter free way. And one important notion in, in, in this proof is that of a component, okay, that's simply a existentially quantified conjunction of literals. And then we have two main lemmas. The first is to say that, well, if you have an exists one induction, then, uh, sorry, if you have an exists one formula with one free variable, then essentially it's equivalent to a disjunction of such components. And I mean, um, is so in a strong sense. So, so what we actually show is that um, we can find an n and a zero and predecessor free components such that we have this equivalence from this from this n onwards. Yeah. Um, essentially, I mean, you have to pick this n large enough to get rid of all the predecessors. And then the second main lemma is to say that, well, if we have such a zero and predecessor free component, um, well, it defines a certain set and we'll call the, 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 the elements of the set solutions. So if, if this has two solutions in the natural numbers, then there exists an entire arithmetic progression such that um, all the elements of the progression are uh, uh, solutions. So in particular in this model M, this means that uh, for all the components of the integers, uh, we have these uh, infinitely many solutions, this entire arithmetic progression. <clears throat> so this, I mean, essentially this comes from the fact that this, I mean, we're working in a, in, a, in, a, in a language of linear arithmetic here. So we have essentially some kind of, well, linear equations here and, uh, and um, well, and, and, well, these e equations, but, uh, well, if, if you look at this closely, uh, you, you can see that they can, Cannot define more complicated sets than this. But but, but here, here in particular, p could be zero, right? The small p. Um, which is this this well, one? The period. Oh no! All right, I, I'm saying that that you have you have this arithmetic uh, progression. The, the yeah. is zero, you know, for, for finite sets. Um, sorry, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Um. Uh, you, you talk about the second lemma or the first one? The second lemma. Like second, okay. If you have two solutions, then you say yeah. the arithmetic progression. Mm -hmm. But but 
so in other words, it, it couldn't be finite? Well, it could be empty. It could not have any solutions at all. Or, but if it has... And it could have one solution. It, it could simply be the formula x is equal to 3. Right. But, but if it has two solutions, uh, it has infinitely many. I see. OK. Yeah. OK. OK, so now we, we can prove this result by, by combining these two lemmas. So OK, how do we show that the induction axiom is satisfied? Well, we assume base and step. Then we get uh, phi on all the net, I mean, on all the standard numbers. And <clears throat> well, this phi now is a, is a finite disjunction of components. OK, and it's true on all the standard numbers. So there must, must be one uh, uh, component that has, uh, well, first, infinitely many solutions in N. So in particular, it has two solutions. And we look at this component and see that, well, by the second lemma, um, it is true on an entire arithmetic progression for uh, for all the, the well, all, all the copies of the integers. And now, if we want to prove phi for some non-standard number i n, we simply use a sufficiently small i p as a basis. So just the, the next i p below this i n, and from this i p, we, we move upwards to i n um, using the successor. Uh, using this this induction step, <clears throat> yeah. So somehow there is so many solutions throughout the, the entire model that we always find one uh, at the right place. Okay, so well, since I'm nearing the end of time, I maybe skip some some open questions, but there's still some 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 loose ends here concerning this exists one uh, induction, and I'll jump directly to the conclusion. So, I mean, what I think we can we can take away from this work is that we have a quite solid strategy for um, analyzing a a method for automated inductive theorem proving from computer science. So this is some of this two step strategy. The first is to find some uh, theory in the sense of mathematical logic, an upper bound t for the strength of m. And then by uh, finding an independence result for T, we get one for M. And of course, as I said repeatedly, the, the whole point of, of, of this, or to, or to make this interesting to the, uh, to the computer scientists, it's important to have a T as small as possible and an independence result somehow as, as practical as, as possible. <clears throat> so what I, I hope that this will uh, lead to in the, in the in the long run is that this um, helps to establish more firm logical foundations for automated inductive theorem proving to uh, help that in this area I mean as, as important as empirical evaluations are to help that in this area more uh, mathematical tools can be used. So I think for for computer science this can help to to clarify the the relationship between these different methods. Uh, to, to existing theories of induction and also to, to challenge problems and, un, and, I mean, independence results. But also, I think for, for mathematical logic, this, uh, this can be a, an, an interesting uh, kind of work because it somehow leads to new questions and, and new problems about um, arithmetical theories, mostly, of course, quite, quite weak arithmetical theories. So con concerning future work, I mean, there's a number of things we... we would like to do uh, if, if time permits this so to say. So um, one thing is we only looked at a, at a small number of, of methods so far. So there's still <clears throat> quite a quite a bunch of, 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 of methods we have not had time to, to really analyze in this manner. In, in, in particular, term rewriting and, and theory exploration. These would be interesting to me because I think they they would all be within open induction, so somehow easy to, to deal with in a way. And of course, I mean, all this should should somehow in the longer develop to a more systematic, towards a more systematic picture, namely uh, which which uh, method solves which which problem. And uh, well, as I also mentioned, so so there is this this whole issue that um, for this application in computer science, we also need to deal with data types different from the numbers. We need to deal with lists, trees, and so on. 
and not so much is known about weak theories for such data types. And then there's other problems like this. Um, the discolumization, so the, one of the things that, that was asked before is that this columization steps, they actually do change the signature. And this creates complications, which, which are sometimes difficult to deal with. And it's not, it's not always clear what kind of effect this has. So, so in how far this can make the, the system stronger or not. So this is, um, it's a difficult thing to deal with properly. <clears throat> And one other issue is, I mean, something that this entire uh, method does not, or this entire strategy does not take into account at all, is the fact that um, these uh, methods, they will generate induction formulas in a way that depends on the goal they want to prove. But so far in, in, in what we did, we did not take into account this dependence, okay? So like in this result of literal induction, um, we just had as an upper bound induction on any literal, but it's not actually what the algorithm does. The, the algorithm will compute some clauses <clears throat> and then from some of these clauses, it will take a literal and do an induction on that one. Yeah, so this is, um, I think this has the, the, I think this shows that these uh, methods are much weaker even than they, they appear from these results. <clears throat> and that this, uh, these theories we are using are still somewhat overly generous because they do not take this dependency into account. But also for this, I don't, I don't really, I don't have any, any right now any good suggestions on how to deal with this on a, on a technical level. Okay, well, that's, that's it from, from my part. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Let's all thank our speaker. Um, and we have time for questions. Uh, if anyone uh, wishes to, to jump in, feel free. Can I ask you, pro probably you, you have this sort of paradigm of you know M and T, right? Now probably mm -hmm. you said all throughout the talk, right? And I just didn't catch it. But could you sort of give me give sort of specific examples or descriptions of what M might be in practice? Like M is like is you know, you said something about like like theory searching or something. You tell it you give it the axioms and you just tell it to go, you know, systematically. Is that is that an example of an M? Yeah, sure. so so I think the best example of an M we had was was this one here. So, um, you you start well, the vampire, out the vampire yeah, thing, all right? The vampire theorem prover, yeah. So, uh, the vampire theorem prover has a, a basic first order proof engine that just runs a saturation based prover, and and would I don't know. From... Okay, so I get, I get I'm asking you, what makes that an an M rather than a T, right? Um, right. I mean, you had you had. I I, I thought there's the M was the M was a method, and then you were trying to somehow find some uh, larger. Uh, I mean, M is not necessarily closed under modus ponens or something. Is that what you're saying? M is just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so first oh, of all, there, like there is. You, yeah. So first of all, I, I don't think I can give a, a formal distinction between M's and T's. I mean, because I mean. Conceptually, the intention is M is something that the computer scientists have developed, and mm -hmm. T is a nice mathematical theory. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I I got that you said that. Right. And then, um, uh, I, mean, that, I could I could believe I you know, um, but I, I guess mean, that, I mean, if you give yourself, for example, if you give yourself like only this rule, right, and like maybe like none of the rest of the deductive calculus, and like maybe that's an M or something. Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, exactly. So so this S uh -huh. is a calculus that deals with pure first order logic. And then you add to it this rule. Um, and yeah, and, and somehow, I mean, the problem is we would like to construct a model for, for I don't know, this, this M that's not a model for a particular sigma. So that's very difficult to do. I mean, how, how we don't have any, any tools in logic to, to construct models of, I don't know, sets of sentences which are provable with some resolution calculus. 
but what we do have is uh, we have uh, lots of techniques for constructing models for theories like this, uh, just some set of axioms plus an induction scheme. Oh, I see. Know, so this is the theory scheme. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is some of the M here, this uh, saturation system plus the single clause induction. And this is our, our theory T. So it's just this, this basic, I mean, this, this, this input axioms T here plus uh, an induction axiom or an induction scheme actually here. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I should also say it's sometimes um, quite challenging to even understand the description of these methods, um, because very often they are described in, in, in a way that's very algorithmic, and it's, uh, so to say, not, not very clear always how this work formally. So I remember that um, uh, at one point, uh, Yannick even had to look into the source code of the theorem prover to understand what would actually happen in, in detail. So so even though I cannot provide a, a precise definition between uh, precise definition of these M's versus the T's, I mean, I think in the practical cases, it's, 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 it's quite yeah, no, I mean, very, very different descriptions. Yeah, no, what you said is better than the definition. It's just, it's a practical, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. One of them is an engineering artifact or something. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But uh, it's it's tied to engineering considerations. Somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Stefan, uh, you you the uh, page with open problems. I think we have you a few minutes. Could you could you go? Back? Ah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So they were specific to the exists one um setting yeah here yeah so okay so so there are two things that that um um i wanted to mention here so so one is um it would be a quite natural extension of this uh, class set cycles to actually to iterate them you know so to prove something by a class set cycle uh and then carry out some some more first order inferences and then make another class set cycle i mean like like nested inductions and actually what what Yannick managed to show is that um the that this iteration actually form a, a hierarchy you know? so the for the the we can find class sets such that with k plus one iterations of this induction rule you could uh, prove strictly more than with k iterations and um in these are uh, these are um, um totality statements of uh uh, of, of some some recursive functions, but um, yeah, what we did not manage to find out is whether um, if we move from the induction rule to the um, um, uh, induction axiom, whether this would give us access to more totality statements. So that that's something we we didn't know. And it would be interesting because I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, especially if the answer is no, because then we would have a, an un, uh, an independent statement for nested class set cycles, right? Because if because the nesting of class set cycles is all included in this uh, hierarchy defined by the rule, and if there's something in the in the axiom that's not provable by the rule, that 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 may be an interesting result. And, and the second thing was, <clears throat> um, we were actually starting out to to analyze this this other um, um, statement, which uh, um, I also mentioned in the first part, namely this this x plus x plus x is equal to x plus x plus x. Um, so we believe that it's also possible to obtain an independence result for this one. Um, but of course, then we have to weaken our base theory a little. So we cannot add commutativity or associativity as, as we did uh, before. But uh, because this is an instance of both commutativity and associativity, right? But we keep all the other basic axioms on, on the successor, predecessor, and addition inside. And we conjecture that uh, this is not provable with parameter free existential one induction. But note, interestingly, that it is provable with literal induction with parameters. Okay. 
And um, I mean, also this would, would be a nice unprovability result for the class set cycles because uh, because the class set cycles are included in this parameter free existential one in Duck G. Uh, but some, somehow this is, uh, yeah, I don't know. This, this, this other E, K, and M result was somehow easier to deal with technically than this one. So so uh, after a certain point, we gave up working on this one and concentrated on this E, K, and M. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, are there any... Uh, you know, maybe maybe it hasn't been studied yet, but are there any natural examples of methods where the the sort of natural theory is much much more um much stronger? Let's say because uh, uh, everything is very very low. Like you're you're using you're you're literally writing out a few a few axioms here plus very low level induction. Um, so, so I'm wondering like uh, do. Are, are, is it, you know, obviously, it comes from the from the computer scientists. So, do they use any methods that that that, that do require more? Yeah, I mean, like, what's what would be like a an, a natural sort of thing that they do, that they use? Uh, uh, does it ever get to somewhere like anyway, some some much? Uh, I guess because you don't you don't do bounded quantifiers. I'm talking yeah, about yeah. like. The arithmetical hierarchy doesn't necessarily make sense, but like, yeah, does it does it ever require? I don't know, well, all, all of all, all of uh, Robinson's arithmetic plus like, I don't know, for a quantifier induction or. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean the I mean so so one. Bad. Let, let me give a bad answer first, and a slightly better answer afterwards. So, so the bad answer is, I mean, of course, you can define a stronger method by just, you know, taking any enumeration of the set of provable sentences of PA and running it until you find the thing that you want to prove. So, so, so mathematically, this is of course possible, and and, and say recursion theoretically, it has the same properties as all these methods. The problem is, of course, that this is not efficient in in an obvious way. So, so, so. Um, a slightly better answer is that I mean this this example shows that there is a is a drawback somehow. So on the one hand, of course, you want your method to be as strong as possible in the sense that it gives you access to as many proofs as possible. On the other hand, the more proofs you can potentially access, the larger your search space gets, and the more useless space you have to run through until you find any proof. So so this is this is always a balance that that they have to strike and and I mean. The solutions that actually work tend to to uh, fall very far on the on the weak side. I mean, as you said, so so all of this is. I mean, I mean, we have some methods that work in in, in for all one induction, but I, I don't know of a realistic method that that would even uh, have a quantifier alternation. Um, yeah. Thanks. That's really interesting. So, and it's it's also in a way I mean it's I mean, it's really somehow the 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 central problem of of automated deduction and it's also connected to the question that was asked in the beginning about proofs with cut. Here it's the same drawback. I mean, of course, in principle, you can search for proofs with cut. The big advantage is it would give you access to much shorter proofs, but the big disadvantage is that it would increase your search space in such a way that you have to run through much more useless space until you find something. So so I mean. As far as I know, for for all the practical methods, this disadvantage outweighs very strongly this disadvantage that you could gain here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I wanted to also ask a little bit about these automated theorem prover, like the software themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Does uh, does any so so it seems like you're trying to get to some sort of generalization that you can uh, prove these independence results that will apply to any of these solvers or any of these th theorem provers. Um, but I, I do, I'm wondering like, are there, um, are, are the different options of theorem provers that are out there, uh, do they affect the, the methods possibly used in it like uh because i i don't know much about them all, all i you know uh, you mentioned one a uh, one today uh the vampire one um but i'm, I'm wondering if like if they're you know in a, if in a totally different theorem prover um software 
is it um is it a, 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 a do they have act right like does it just have more power or do, you know is it sort of solving completely orthogonal problems mm. it's a very uh, it, it, it's not necessarily a well-formed question, so yeah, uh, yeah, no, no, I, <laughs> feel free to kind of take it however it makes sense to you. Yeah, so, I mean, for, I mean, our impression was that uh, many of these theorem provers are very, very specialized in the sense that they are based on a small number of, of examples and the methods that are implemented are very strongly tailored to these particular examples. So, um, unfortunately, I have not not prepared all the details, but I think I think we had a result that so 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 we had this one result that this even odd example is not provable by vampire, but it is provable by this closed set cyclist. And I I'm not sure if. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we had many similar results of this kind. So, 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 uh, simple um, um, formulas which would be provable in one method but not in the other. So it's, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it would be. I mean, this is this also goes in this in this direction of this of this systematic picture. So, so I don't think we have a very good systematic picture yet. But I mean, from from what we could see during this work, it seems that the methods are very specialized to particular problems and work quite well on, on these. Like, I mean, another example is that this, uh, this closed set cyclist, we believe, we don't have to result it, but we, we conjecture this fails to prove this x plus x plus x is equal to x plus x plus x. But that's actually something that the vampire prover would prove um, because, I mean, even though it uses only literal induction, it does allow parameters. And, and then you have two com incomparable theories, the existential one parameter free induction is incomparable with the literal induction with parameters. Um, and, and I think that this, this continues like this. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I, I think this is, this is, uh, no, I I, no, that was really interesting. Um, again, I don't think yeah, I necessarily yeah. asked a very <laughs> coherent <laughs> question, but, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, other, other, other questions? Okay, let's let's thank Stefan again. Um, thank you, Stefan. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It was was really nice to talk here, and it was very uh, nice to get so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Um, next week we have uh, Mengzhou Sun from Singapore, um, who's speaking about uh, co-final extensions. So, um, at, and I think it's at the same time. Do we did we change the time for that, Roman? Sorry. Did we change the time for for that time? Uh, oh no, we didn't. He didn't okay. request. So we okay. only have to All right. So um. So yeah. So yeah. Please come back for that. Uh. And this should be up on YouTube. Uh. Shortly.